my master research, but um, then I got some insight from some colleagues, so I, so I wanted to put their names here in the first slide. Uh, but what is the adherence to the principles of criminal law? Um, the, definition, the, the operative definition for this research is the degree on which members of the public um, believe and endorse uh, the liberal principles and right aimed at, at set internal controls and limits to the state punitive power, like presumption of innocence, due process, or reasonable doubt, and so forth. Um, this deals under the beliefs or if people endorse the conditions under which uh, punishment is applied, legal punishment is applied in our society. Um, the main um, questions uh, that I'm going to trans try to answer here is um, a descriptive one, uh, to what extent do members of the public endorse or believe in the principles of criminal law, which factors influence this adherence, how the public adherence uh, influence trust in justice system. Um, the guiding theoretical framework is pontiveness, especially pontive attitude, because um, removal or restriction of criminal and criminal procedural right um, could uh, drive to um, talk uh, unfair on excess, disproportionate or excessive punishment. So this is the the theory that guides the, this research. Um, now, if we move to the methodological uh, aspect, um, this was a quantitative uh, research um, uh, that used a survey design. Um, the sample was a um, non-random sample um, composed of uh, 369 cases or responded, and it was conducted in the city of Concepcion, Chile. Um, the main variable, uh, the adherence to the principles of criminal law, was measured through a scale of adherence to the principles of criminal law that uh, was composed of uh, 46 Laker type items, and each question was written in everyday and non-juridical language. Um, each question contained a principle, for example, presumption of innocence or reasonable doubt. And each principle was measured according to poles of social rejection of crime. Um, question about high rejection, murder, rape, or pedophilia, and lower rejection like petty theft, pickpocketing, con artist, and so forth. Um, the validity and the reliability of the scale um, was uh, established by exploratory factor analysis and alpha Cronbach tests. Um, our independent variables were sociodemographic variables. We consider also sociopolitical variables. And uh, finally, a set of criminological variables like fear of crime, knowledge of criminal justice system or trust in many. Um, now, uh, Let's move to the to our results. Uh, the first um, interesting finding is that the adherence to the principles of criminal law is a multidimensional phenomenon. It has six general dimensions: proportionality of punishment, due process, legality. So it's not uh, unidimensional, but rather multidimensional. And if we pay attention now to the descriptive results, for example, um, uh, the percentage. Um, we, uh, we can appreciate that um, uh, just in, in, a, in two out of six scales or dimensions, there is a positive adherence to the principles of criminal law. Thus, uh, people support the due process and the uh, humanity of punishment or humanitarian punishment. But also it's important to, to state here that this value is barely over 50%. It's not really high. Yes, uh, um, so it's a bit uh, worrying, these, these, uh, these values. Uh, these uh, six dimensions compose the general scale of adherence to the principles of criminal law. It was average, uh, the scores. Um, the, 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 uh, when we pay attention to the adher general adherence to the principles of criminal law, we can uh, appreciate that uh, just 40% or about 40% of the sample support the principles of criminal law. 
Okay, that so uh, the general result is also a bit uh, worrying too, because uh, it say that uh, uh, almost um, four uh, out of ten people uh, don't uh, just four out of ten people do uh, accept the principles of criminal law. Um, but now um, let's go to the explanatory result to understand why. Uh, people are there or not to the principles of criminal law. For this, um, I conducted a path analysis with regression that consists in introducing uh, some variables in a sequential causal model to establish uh, direct and indirect effect uh, among variables. And theory guides the hypothetical model. So we are going to explain the, the path analysis. Uh, our first result uh, our first uh, set of variables was criminological variables in order to simplify the, the, the visual um, or to simplify the interrelations between variables. Uh, green, uh, green rows um, are a positive impact and red rows um, means an inverse impact. So um, if we pay attention now to fear of crime, um, fear of crime has a direct impact um, on adherence to the principles of human law. So uh, those people that are more afraid of crime believe less in the principles of criminal law. Uh, then if we move to trust in media, um, media has both a direct and indirect impact because those people that trust more in media um, adhere or support less the principles of criminal law and also they are more afraid of crime. This is consistent with the literature because um, this is consistent with the literature because uh, media and crime news tend to uh, distort and overestimate the um, rates of crime in society or the, le le the levels of crime in society. Um, finally, if we move to uh, criminal justice, knowledge of criminal justice system, uh, there is an impact on uh, the adherence because those people that understand more the functioning of the criminal justice system uh, have a better knowledge, a greater knowledge, um, are there more to the principles of criminal law. And also those who has a uh, uh, better understand of criminal justice system has uh, more levels of fear of crime, of fear of crime too. Uh, but now, what happens when we introduce sociological and politological variables? Go to the next slide. So um, political profile was measured through um, five uh, points where right wing, uh, left wing profile is zero and right wing profile is five. Um, so um, data here show that there is a direct um, influence in, she, in the adherence to the principles of criminal law, um, right-wing people uh, would adhere uh, less to the principles of criminal law, support less to the principles of criminal law, and also uh, right-wing people uh, would be more afraid of crime too. Um, the reason for this, uh, there are two basic reasons, uh, conservative uh, positions or conservative orientations believe that um, punishment is a source of endorsement to the uh, uh, social consensus or to the status quo. And also from a capitalist point of view, uh, the responsibility of crime is individual. So the lawbreaker have to burden with the whole uh, punishment. Not, there's not uh, social factors that influence uh, crime. Uh, then if we move to the other variable, social bonds, uh, social bonds was measured through a proxy. Uh, the question was, um, in case uh, you lost your job, to how many people you could ask for help. So um, people with a stronger social bond, the, the, the answers um, uh, have to be a number, uh, six persons, six people, eight people. And the results show that um, uh, people with a stronger social bond are there more to the principles, support more the principles of criminal law. And also people with stronger social bonds are less afraid of crime, which in turn influence the adherence indirectly. And also people with stronger social bonds uh, uh, has uh, higher levels of trust in media. Okay. 
Uh, then, if we move to the other variables, the demographic variables, um, we can, uh, it's very evident that education plays a key role in shaping the adherence to the principles of criminal law. So uh, here, more educated people, uh, the, the green, if we pay attention to the green row, the first green row, uh, more educated people endorse and believe more in the principles of criminal law, but also uh, uh, more educated people has higher levels of trust in media. Okay, they trust more in media. Oh, sorry, they trust less in media. Uh, this is because they will be more critical uh, with the information delivered by media. By media. Um, also, uh, more educated people are less afraid of crime for different reasons. They are less influenced by media or also they live in probably in safer uh, areas. Um, they, are, they have stronger social bonds, which in turn influence uh, positively the adherence to the principles of criminal law. And also, more educated people has a, a greater knowledge of criminal justice system, which in turn influence the adherence to the principles of criminal law. Gender variable is especially interesting here because um, when we analyze uh, uh, on a bivariate way, just to uh, analyzing gender and adherence, there is a significant relation. Women support less the principles of criminal law than men. Uh, but when we introduce other variables, when we control by other variables, uh, this relation becomes insignificant, especially when we control by fear of crime. Uh, that means that uh, women will support less the principles of criminal law because they feel more vulnerable in society. Um, so they are more afraid of crime because they are more afraid of crime. And also uh, this is consistent with uh, feminist or feminist theories in crime. Um, there is always present the idea of the the, the shadow of sexual assault. That to say that uh, any crime, uh, pickpocketing or uh, robbery can uh, could become in a sexual assault, as a, uh, could result in a sexual assault. So um, it is uh, sensitive to expect that they present a lower adherence, but this relation, uh, as I say, becomes insignificant when controlling by other variables. And finally, um, if when uh, we analyze uh, the adherence uh, with a trust in courts and trust in police, um, those people that adhere more to the principles of criminal law um, trust more in court. Uh, this will, the reason for this is that the, the sense of justice will be in tune with the sense of justice of the judge and other justice decision makers. Uh, so the, 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 there is, uh, there are in the same in the same line. And finally, and paradoxically, those people that are there less, sorry, that those people or those individuals that that are there more to the principles of criminal law, has uh, lower levels of trust in police. In a Latin American context, when there are uh, abuse are very frequent. So trust in police will be an index of punitiveness rather than trust in justice. So um, people that believe in criminal and procedural rights um, could trust less in police, will try uh, trust less in, in, in the in police work. Um, okay, let's go to the conclusion. There are some sampling and measurement limitations, but we could at least establish that uh, the adherence influence trust in courts and trust in police, um, that most factors play a direct and indirect uh, role in, in shaping the adherence to the principles of criminal law. Um, and most interesting here is that uh, this type of research helped to understand uh, better why individuals endorse or support the condition under which legal punishment is applied and justified in liberal Western countries, and also help to understand better public punitiveness and the cultural basis for penal populism that could be a treatment for uh, human rights or the rule of law. Um, thank you. Uh, I guess that that is all. Um, if you have any question, I will try to answer them. Um, and thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Pablo. That was really fascinating. Um, thank you for sharing your preliminary results with us. Um, yes, applause. <laughs> um, and next up, we have Daniela, um, who is a Chilean lawyer and criminologist with a master's in criminology and criminal justice um, at the, from the University of Edinburgh. And she's also now a th third year PhD re researcher here at the university. Um, of Edinburgh Law School, um, researching elderly prisoners in Chile. Her research is focused on the sociology of punishment, penal populism, and prison population in Chile, specifically centered on the characteristics and challenges of the elderly prison population in Chile. Um, she specializes in qualitative research and digital research methods. Um, and uh, without further ado, it's uh, all yours, Daniela. Thank you. Thank you, MJ, for that kind presentation. <laughs> I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Perfect. So, let me just... okay. Um, I'm so happy for this invitation. This is the first time that I'm going to present the results that I have. And I realized that I could talk for like half hour about it. So <laughs> I'll try to be brief and to stick to the time. So, um, well, basically I'm going to present the findings that I um, found in my recent field work. So I hope you will enjoy this presentation. So the overview, um, I'm going to briefly talk about the problem, uh, what I did, also methods, and most importantly, what I found and some sort of brief conclusion, and we will have time for questions and answers at the end. So what is the problem? So uh, these are the figures that I found when I started this research. And if you can see, uh, there are like more than a thousand people over 60 years old in prison in Chile. And we don't know anything about it, to be honest. So there is no research about it. Uh, so this, I, I have done research with elderly before and I start the questioning what's going on with these people, you know, uh, who are they and what are they doing in prison, how, how are they living. So that's what I want to answer with this um, research. I choose people over 60 years old because that's uh, the, um, the law in Chile state that people are considered elderly from 60 years old. So that, that was basically it. Uh, so you can see here, these demographics, you can see that people over 60, between 60 and 69, is like 900 of them. So most of them are between that court. And most of them, 37% are in the metropolitana, metropolitana region. That's the capital of Chile. So that's why most of my interviewees were from there. So what I did to understand what's going on with them, um, I did this qualitative research. So this is completely different to what Pablo just presented. And this is an exploratory research because as I say before, there was no research about it. So I, I didn't know what I was going to find out. I didn't have any, I, I had, I, I read comparative research from other places. So I, I have some expectations, but I wasn't sure what I could find. And I did interviews, so these interviews were online. Uh, it was not my first choice, to be honest, but at the end, they, they, they end up really well. And I use MS Team, and these were semi-structured interviews. If you don't know what it, this is, that is, is, a, is when you do open-ended question and, and you allow discussion. So you get this really long answer. And interviews were about between one and two hours. I think I have, two that were like two and a half hours, but yeah, mostly they were between one and two hours. So the participants were, I have 22 interviews. So the practitioners that I choose were people that work or have worked with elderly in prison. Even if they didn't work exclusively, exclusively with them, I only found two practitioners that work exclusively with elderly. Uh, all the others, elderly in prison, all the others were working with general population and some of the people that they were with were elderly. 
So the people were from six different NGOs, one from academia and 17 from government institutions like the service for the elderly, the prison service, the National, um, uh, Institute, National Institute for Human Rights, the defense office, and also the judiciary. If you see the numbers don't add because <laughs> it's more than 22, it's because some of them were working for the government and they were also volunteering for NGOs. And I also had the chance to interview three prisoners. Two of them were over 60 and one of them was over 50. And he was, uh, I interviewed him because he was the one kind of in, in charge of helping uh, people over 60 in, in his prison. But I ended up finding out that he was considered old too. So um, yeah, well, that's, that's another story, I think. <laughs> But yeah, generally, I, I think retrospectively thinking about it, probably I should consider elderly people over 50 because the other prisoners consider people over 50 like old. And yeah, so they treat it like that. So what did I found? Um, well, first, who are they? Uh, it was really hard to find this number, <laughs> but this is data before COVID, so I will try to get an updated um, numbers about them because some of them were released during COVID uh, using different laws that were uh, created to, to help them. So I will try to get more updated numbers, but this is... Um, what, why they are in prison, basically. So you can see here, 26% of them are by because of drugs, drugs offenses, mostly like dealing, but just a small amount of drugs. 25% um, about sex related crimes. Uh, so 51% are just in these two categories. Then we have, you can see 40% of homicide and 5% of kidnapping. And this sounds like a high rate, but to be honest, these most of them are in a special category because it's not like normal homicide or normal, if I, I, you can consider normal kidnapping. But I mean, these are related to things that happened during uh, the dictatorship. So these were actually crimes against humanity. So they have really, really long sentences. 89% of them are male. 78% um, are with a conviction and 22% on remand. 22% on remand for like Chilean numbers is not really high. So that's kind of good. I, I, I'm guessing here, but I need to uh, I study more about it. I think because um, they try not to send them to prison uh, on remand. Uh, that's why the numbers are lower. In, in general, it's like more than 30% of people in prison are on remand in Chile right now. Um, and 99% of them are totally confined. That means that they don't have benefits. So they have, they are in prison 24 seven. They don't go out during the day or during the weekends. This is because normally their convictions are really high and they don't have right to benefits. Um, so about what I found about health and mental health. Um, I think this summarizes everything. Uh, one of practitioners says they sacrifice quality over quantity. So they try to cover the whole population with really, really low stuff. So there is no um, really a good program to follow, follow up people with chronic conditions that need permanent support. So, and there is also, I did not found any specific health problem or support or prevention anything related to the elderly and they don't have access to geriatric specialities. Um, so basically they have the same limited access as any other prison, prisoner. This is not surprising. I think this is what I was expecting to find out. But I think this is really important because when I talked to the prisoners and, and the practitioners, this was the main thing that they mentioned. It. So I think improving access to health and mental health care uh, will really, really, really help them. Um, so why they don't have access to benefits or interventions? So the main problem that I found out is that what some of the practitioners call the hyper profile or the prototype. So is this young first time offender male that has a short sentences. So this person will get all the benefits, all the support, or all the interventions, because um, the system is created to focus on people that are going out to work. So they want to help them. 
to do that. And they think that these people, like the young ones and first time offenders, are going to be the one that can actually get a job. So there is a cherry picking here and the intervention goes only to these people. So there are no opportunities to people that are going out to get the pensions. So um, because they are not going into the workforce and they are not part of any reintegration program, like not at all. Because what I say, the all the reintegration program focus on two things, labor and the networks and elderly persons are not going out to work and they don't have really good networks, not family networks or friends or social networks in, in general. So what do they do inside prison? This is going to sound crazy, but most of the people, most of the practitioners and the prisoners say, we play cards. So what, that's what they do. They play cards all day, every day. And if they have the skill, uh, it's insane. I, I find it like really insane that everyone around there, they just answer that we play cards, you know? Um, and some of them do some artwork or craft work if they have the skills because they don't teach you how to do it. So if you know how to do it, you can get the materials and, and work on it. They can also go to school. So that's basically the only program that they are allowed or they are able to attend um, because there is no condition to, to go. Um, other programs need some requirements and the requirements are normally um, physical skills that they may not have or um, being in this, in this profile of people that are going out to work. So they don't do sport either because the sport that they practice in prisons is football and is basically aimed for young people. So, and the, the only thing and the only actual um, work that they can do and, and it's like their established position inside the prison is what they call El Mozo. So El Mozo is this person that helps with the cleaning inside a bedroom. Uh, a bedroom is basically a cell, but it's shared. There are prisons that are like, you can have 20 people in the same space. So this person, El Mozo, is in charge of keeping this clean or keeping everything safe. Um, and sometimes they work for the prison service too. Uh, this is not an official position. It's not really allowed in some prisons but they get some points for good behavior. So if they want to apply for benefits, this is the only thing that they can do to actually get the, those points because they can't go to formal um, activities. About the relationships. So um, they normally have broken relationships with their families, especially if you, you've seen a large number of sex offenders in this court. And uh, you can imagine that they, um, Normal, the, the problem is that the, normally the offense could be inside the family. So they receive less visit and support from outside. And also because normally the visit that you have in prison is your mother or your wife. And in this case, they don't have mother and not necessarily have a wife at this point. So, and this is more dramatic for women because if they don't have a daughter, they basically don't get any, any uh, visit. Um, uh, so the relationship with the prison service is normally better than with other prisoners because in general elderly prisoners are considered well behaved like not really uh, dangerous I mean but it's also very patronizing um, there is a tendency that's going like, oh yeah grandpa you know um, and tendency to ignore their needs because they don't complain too much. Uh, so it's like, yeah, you know, it's not feeling well. Okay, he wants to go to the doctor again, you know. Uh, so yeah, you know, but they are not going to make too much fuss about it. So they don't prioritize, prioritize them, yeah. Um, but the most important thing here is the relationship with other prisoners because they normally are adopted by other prisoners. And this adoption is just because of the goodwill of the prisoners. They, they normally don't even get paid or something like that. So they are treated, they, they call them the taita, that's like, um, or mamita, that's like a nice way of saying like a grandparent. Um, 
and and the other prisoners are the ones that inform about the situation you know are the ones about that they complain so younger ones are saying you know uh, please help this person this person is not feeling okay uh, he needs her, his medication things like that so um this without them to be honest their life will be like really 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 uh, impossible inside the only exception here is with sex offenders there is a duality here some people um, just uh, don't want to integrate them or don't want to support, support them because they are sex offenders so um sex offenders are really 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 left behind uh, but it will depend sometimes they support each other too so <clears throat> i think this is the key thing here is the relationship with other prisoners because it's, it's the only way they, that they can survive inside and it's better than expected they are not really bullied normally but to be honest sex offenders are normally keep um, separate from them too so <clears throat> conclusion about the things that i mentioned so if we want them to go out at some point and to be uh, helpful outside we need to stop thinking about resocialization as going to going out to work because it's basically that resocialization in the prison system in chile is about going out to work and if you are not doing that uh, you don't get any access to any program also, a thing that I didn't mention here because I didn't have enough time, but the discussion in, in about the conditions of the elderly in prison in Chile is very politicized. Uh, is uh, because I, I mentioned some of them are there because crime from against humanity, but this is a really low percentage. It's only like ten percent of them. So most of them are. Um, but when when we talk about them, most of the people think about them. And they don't want people like the general public don't want to give any any benefits to those people you know the, the ones that commit crimes against humanity but the other 90 percent of them is just left behind because they are they are kind of absorbed in this discussion and but the basic thing that i think we need to change is that we need to stop depending on the goodwill of the other prisoners and start creating a protocol of their attention as one of the practitioners mentioned in the case of women, we cannot leave everything to sorority, you know, just being uh, nice with the, each other. <laughs> and I didn't have any time to mention this, but I, I would just want to point out that I also have um, points about women in prison, about infrastructure, segregation uh, versus integration, legal aspect, and things about COVID. So if you want to ask about that, <laughs> it's okay too. So yeah, and I want to leave you with this. This is something that an elderly prisoner wrote. This is a book that I found hidden <laughs> through my research. So this is published. Um, in this person was an elderly prisoner and published this in 2002, and he died in prison in 2004. And I found this book in <laughs> hidden in the <laughs> library of the of the prison. But yeah, here. It is. So that's it. I hope you enjoy it and open to listen to your question now. Thank you very much, Daniela. That was very fascinating. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your results with us. Um, well done. Well done to you, Daniela, and well done, Pablo Tambien. I mean, also. Um, now we're going to move over to the Q&A session. And I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Deborah Rousseau, um, also here at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and she will take uh, your questions and um, from the, if you want to raise your hand or in the chat. So over to you, Deborah. Thanks to MJ and to both of you for your contributions. It's great to, to share um, your research in, in this context and as, especially at our last session of, of the year. So thank you for that. Um, we have a few questions on the chat. Uh, we have one from Francesca. I don't know whether she'd like to um, appear in person or not. Um, if not, I'll read the question out. Um, I'll read it out. I think so. She's in the office, so she might prefer me to, to read it out. So um, for Pablo, is adherence here meant to measure people's behavior or is it solely related to agreement with the principles regardless of actual compliance? 
thank you so much, uh, Francesca, for the for your question. Um, no, this um, uh, this research uh, does not uh, did not address uh, behavior itself, but um, but uh, the adherence uh, it's an um, the cognitive aspect of attitude or public attitude. So, and attitudes are uh, considered uh, an, an, a strong predictor of behavior. Um, so to the extent that people, for example, oh, so uh, uh, even though we are not measuring behavior uh, itself, um, uh, it is very reasonable to expect that the adherence or the, of if people do not support the principles of criminal law has an impact on the uh, observable behavior. For example, people that support less the principles of criminal law uh, would support or vote for candidates that are aiming to increase punishment, uh, that want to, for example, go out from international covenant or something like this. So it can uh, support uh, punitive policies. So um, it should have an impact uh, on the behavior. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a question too. Um, how you mentioned social bonds and how, how did you define social bonds in your research? Oh, um, okay, interesting. Um, operative was, was measured by, um, uh, by, by, by a proxy variable, but it deals well with social anxieties uh, because people that are less connected with other people um, they don't have uh, support from other people. And this is related with um, social, social networks. I think this is the concept in English, I don't know. But um, people uh, with stronger social bonds um, will feel more diffuse anxieties, anxieties um, in the general life, uh, not, general, not, not uh, only anxieties uh, regarding job, but also they feel more insecure in, in so, so the, 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 the concept of social bonds deal with insecurities uh, because uh, people feel less connected with others, uh, more alone, and thus increase the diffuse anxieties, as we say. Interesting, thank, thank you, Pablo. Thank you, Deborah. Um, I'm not sure there's any more questions for Pablo. Any more questions for Pablo? from the audience. Fernando is raising his hand. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. Sorry. Sorry, I, I never find the virtual hands and it changes in all the things. So it's just, sorry, <laughs> it's just a normal thing. So uh, it was a very interesting. Thank you so much for to both of you. It was just very nice and it's very nice to come back to this to this uh, community reading group sessions. Uh, for uh, Pablo, I think it's very interesting. And for me, it's really hard to ask something without like looking more into detail, but how would you take this forward? Because it seems like a quite comprehensive study, and uh, I can see a lot of policy implications. And uh, how, what, what are your plans with this research? Are you just going to leave it as it is, or do you plan to take this forward and do something else in the future? Uh, yes, um, in the future, for my uh, uh, now in my my doctorate, I want to um, improve the scale of adherence to the principles of criminal law uh, because it has some. Uh, it has just an exploratory valid validation with uh, fact exploratory factor analysis. And also there are the sample has uh, some bias, but I want to improve the scale um, considering uh, other variables, for example, victimization or the impact uh, not only on trusting justice, but also on legitimacy, for example. And on practical terms, it may have um, important consequences because or significant consequences because, uh, for example, um, uh, if a variable shows, if, if, if one variable shows that uh, knowledge of criminal justice system uh, improves the levels of adherence to the principles of criminal law, um, campaigns or more information to the population could enhance the adherence to the principles of criminal law. So people will understand better how the system works if, for example, someone is on parole is not an index that someone is not receiving any penalties related with the presumption of innocence. So, um, so the the obviously um, uh, practical policies for this 
um, will not uh, reduce completely uh, the punitiveness, the punitive attitudes or the adherence. Uh, but um, the main issue here is that the, the support for criminal principles do not drop too far in order to have uh, good levels of legitimacy and trust in the criminal justice system. So I think that uh, this could lead to some policies aimed at that uh, improve the levels of adherence in society. I'm not sure if this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And uh, can I just make a further <laughs> question yeah. or like so, sorry, uh, like a, a further point? And this is in relation to, to Francesca's uh, question as well. And uh, I think it will be worth it just exploring a little bit the relationship between perception and actually real levels, because that was something that I did something completely different in my PhD. But that's something that I was wasn't criticized, but it's a point that has been has been addressed by a couple of of reviewers <laughs> so yeah it's just taking that you know like this assumption we assume that sometimes behavior or perception beha perceived behavior is going to be as strongly associated with actual levels of something could be adherence or could be something but some probably it could be something that you can explore in your in your yes. further analysis both uh, i think per perception uh, perception per se is such an interesting variable but also actual or real levels of adherence to, to adherence of those principles and if you can compare those actually though i think it will make a stronger case for your assumptions but oh, yeah. overall thank you so much thank you so much <laughs> thank you fernando thank you fernando for your comments uh, very insightful um i think unless there's more questions for pablo i think we've got um yeah um more yeah. um i don't know is is that a Morales is the same name. She's got her hand up. I'm sorry. I can't see. Okay. Okay. Great. Sorry. Daniela. No, sorry. Hi. Nice to meet you. Oh, you're here. I'm sorry. <laughs> the other. Um, yes, I have a question for Daniela. Probably, I, uh, I really, I really enjoyed the presentation. I really into uh, research in prison in Chile. I'm Chilean too. For the ones that doesn't know me. Uh, I probably missed that part, uh, but uh, I want to ask whether the prisoners that you are talking about are long-term prisoners, aren't they? Uh, I'm not too sure about that, because the problem is that the people that, that have been in prison for a very long time, isn't it? Yeah, so there, there are two kinds of elderly prisoners, basically. One after that, some of them are like basically glow, growing old in prison. Yeah. And, and others are uh, in prison when they are already old. So um, that's a theoretical difference, but I couldn't make a practical difference because I didn't interview them at the end. So I, I only interviewed practitioners that were with them. So they, they didn't make that difference. They, the only difference was, um, it was related only by about their age. However, um, most of the, most of the one with, uh, what I found out is many of them with there are like um, dealing with are convicted because of drug offenses. Many of them are actually uh, convicted when they are already old. Uh, so I think someone asked about the convictions. So normal like trafficking is between five and fifteen years. In general, there are like other <laughs> there are other issues to take in account. But in general, like you can say that for trafficking you get between five and fifteen years. And because pensions are so low and stuff, many of the elderly move to drug dealing when they are old. Um, uh, and also, even if they were other, they were criminals in other areas maybe, and they move to drug dealing because it's kind of something that you can do when you are old. And, and also I found out, especially women, many people mentioned that they blame themselves for a crime that didn't commit. So they, they basically their son don't go don't go to he doesn't go to prison because she prefers to go to prison instead things like that um so that's one thing but the, also many of them especially the ones that um homicide and kidnapping the worst crime committed in like 40 years ago and they are in prison now just now um so not, I think most of them are actually getting in prison when they are old and not many of them growing old yet, because there are more now, since we end up like the death penalty and we move to this um, 
uh, how you say in English, like la, la, life sentence. It's 40 yeah. years without benefits in Chile. So more people are, are growing old with that conviction now. So that's a number that is going to increase in the future, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's mixed, to be honest. Yeah. yeah, that's a very important point because probably the, the experience and how the experience in prison and, and the perception of how are they getting is going to be different for someone that spent a long time in prison. I'm going to let behind, or no, I'm not going to talk about those convicted for a crime against humanity, mm -hmm. but long term prisoner probably at some point they could have had some sort of benefit the one that they are not able to access right now, but the one that uh, got into prison when they were old already, I are completely excluded from all of those. And yes, that's other discussion about the... Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, that's that's true. But uh, the ones that are, are getting all inside prison compared to the ones that are inside when they are old. And also many of them, uh, because the three prisoners that, that I talked to, they had previous conviction. So that's why they don't have benefits now. Also. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they have been in prison a couple of times before they, they were old. And that's why they know the difference between being young and being old in prison. That's another story, too. So they, they have different experience in their previous convictions. Uh, they, they were placed in a different space and they have a different uh, rank among the prisoners, too. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you very much for your question. Okay. Um, I'm okay, I'm Jack, I can actually, I'm fine. Um, so we've got a question from Francesca in the chat for Daniela, and then we've got a question from Fernando. So Francesca for Daniela, she finds the data really interesting. Happy you found a way to move forward with this, with this research despite the major COVID difficulties. I'm wondering whether evangelical wings were a thing in the prisons you examined, and if so, how did they affect elderly prisoners? Yeah, so that's really important. So these evangelical wings, uh, not every prison has one, but the, the big prisons, all, all of them have like a, this evangelical wing, what they call the brothers, los hermanos. This is, the, they talk about los hermanos. So, um, so many of the elderly prisoners are, uh, they, when they classify them at the beginning, they are sent to this, a space, especially if they, ex if they are sex offender, unless there is a, a secure space, a special secure space, like a special win with secure win for, for sex offender or people with other problems um, like that, security issues. Um, then the other, then the next step to a secure place is this evangelical win. So it's the most secure place that you could be in the general population, basically. But they have their own rules. So you need to go to mass and you need to, uh, you, you, you can't drink, you can't steal. So they have this rule. And, and stealing is really common in, in Chilean prisons, to be honest. So, but if you are there, you are safe. But, and, but if they, they find you doing some of these things, they can expel you from there. So, and, and you will be sent to, so uh, one of the practitioners said, you can be the most Catholic person like for like your first 80 years of life, but you arrive there <laughs> and you immediately become evangelical because you know this is the only place that you can survive if you are old. So yes, yes, that's an, a really, really important. And it is considered a safe space in prison and, and many people aim to go there even if they are not really evangelical that before arriving there, yeah. Thank you, Francesca, very much for your question and Daniela for your answer. Uh, we're running out of time, but Fernando has his hand up. So go ahead, Fernando. Uh, I'll do it really quickly. I, it's just like, it's fascinating. And uh, apologies if I don't know that much about the, the, the topic, but I, 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 I was thinking about what happens when they are released after, like these elderly people when they are released. And I've seen some documentaries on TV, I, again, my knowledge is very rare, that actually in some countries, including Mexico, but also in countries like Japan, people actually start committing some minor offenses in order to go back to prison because they as you mentioned they are alone in their lives so they are actually the only safe place where well they can actually have a roof for them and food and things like that so i i was wondering if something similar happens in in, in chile or if you came across any of these situations in your research yeah not exactly that situation 
there. Uh, I did a similar, smaller research before my master, and, and I found a story, like, story like that in here. Uh, someone that was a convicted sex offender that they, they because here they have like many rules if you want to go out on parole you cannot meet other sex offenders and sex offenders are your only friends in prison if you are a sex offender so you cannot meet them when they, you're outside so so one of them was on parole and he actually mentioned it like that he was uh, through his window watching uh, kids going out from school and of course if you mention that it's because you want to return to prison. <laughs> so yeah, but, but in Chile, I found out that most of them want to go out, uh, to be honest, uh, because prison is really tough. So they, they, they want to, and I didn't talk to, them, to people that were outside. So I don't know if, if they were, while they're outside thinking that they want to return. But at least when they are inside, they really, really want to go out. And they have many, many problems because if, even if you want to go out for the weekend, something like that, you, the most important thing that you need is a space to be during the weekend. So some of the lawyer when, were, or the social workers were mentioning me that they needed to talk to charities that can uh, give them a space during the weekend. Otherwise, they can't go out. And, and to get that space can take years because they don't have family, so they don't have a place. To, so the, the prison service won't allow you to go out if you don't have a place to stay. And they don't have a place to stay. So um, that's even if the, because there is a minority that can access to this benefit. Uh, and the, even this minority that can get this access, they cannot actually use it because they don't comply with the requirements. So it's, it's really hard, yeah. Thank you, Daniela, and thank you, Fernando, for your question. Uh, we've come to the end of the hour. Um, so thank you, Pablo and Daniela, very much again for, for presenting for us today. It was very fascinating, and we love learning about your the the results of your both of your researches and we both we all me Deborah and Andrea uh, all wish you very 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 much good luck in the future um, and for us um, it's this is our the last uh, seminar of uh, semester but we will be back in, in September um, from on my behalf and I know Deborah and Andrea want to say something we've enjoyed having the seminar series very much even though it's been online uh, there's been some positives that we've been able to reach more people um, due to it being online, um, but we hope that we could can welcome you face to face in the near future. Um, Deborah, Andrea, do you guys want to say anything? Um, ditto. Um, it was great fun to organize and to 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 you know experience so many different uh, sessions and which were really fascinating. Um, and. I mean, I just hope that we'll be able to meet in person. And it is, it is true that we were able to reach out to kind of further away audiences, but it's also true that it's nice to be able to be together. So hopefully that will be the new reality from September. Best of luck to everyone. And thanks for your contributions, Pablo and Daniela. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Okay, Andrew, thank you do you much. have something to say? <laughs> no? <laughs> Nothing you guys haven't covered, covered okay. already. Well, so I just will just thank one, you last, one last word is, um, well, P Pablo, you can pop your email in the chat for people as well, like Daniela did if you want. Um, I've enjoyed working with my colleagues, Deborah and Andrea, very much. Uh, we've gotten to know each other. So that's also been a very nice pleasure. Um, yeah, Daniela has her email in the chat and Pablo as well. You can reach us on lawcrg at ed.ac.uk or Twitter or Facebook. Um, and watch out, this video will also be uploaded to our media, media channels, YouTube and Media Hopper. Um, have a lovely weekend and um, see you all in September. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nice to see you guys. You guys Bye. too. <laughs> Ciao.